This is ABC Fora. Good evening, friends. I'm delighted to have been asked to introduce Dr. Sarah Roy of Harvard University as Sydney ID's international guest lecturer this evening. In every sense, Dr. Roy is in Australia to celebrate the memory of the great intellectual Edward Said. Edward Said, and two words of condolences. Thus spoke my friend and colleague on the phone on Friday morning, September 26, 2003. This was all we said. The loss was greater than any words. We dreaded that moment since we learned of Edward Said's serious illness. My friend was more fortunate than I. He had met him in person. He always tells of how a conference hall in London was electrified when Edward Said walked in unannounced. During the years of Said's battle with illness, we followed, or rather chased him, everywhere. In bookshops, in journals, on the internet. We have his writings on every reading list. Immediately after learning the alphabet, my students of Arabic learn about two cultural icons, Fayrouz and Edward Said. My friend and I, as I'm sure many Saidian disciples around the world, were racing to acquire his books. We now have the whole collection, some in more than one copy. But Edward Said was faster, faster in his creative presence and in his absence. We feed his absence. We feared that his works would disappear from bookshops, but they didn't. Edward Said continues to speak through his own writings, his students, his children, and his humanist disciples. Do intellectuals die? Edward Said has been a source of hope in Arab and human intellectualism, in his life and work, his engaged advocacy for human justice and peace, and his tireless defense of Palestinian rights. At the personal and intellectual level, Saeed has inspired many as the embodiment of hope, a reassuring presence in the pressing time and a hopeless age. This source of hope in humanity is now no more, wrote one friend in his obituary. But do intellectuals die? Edward Said's writings inspire a great sense of hope. I'm personally inspired by his notion of the dynamics of politics, power, and resistance, and his criticism of Foucault's theory of power, which he says is used to justify political quietism with sophisticated intellectualism. There is, after all, Said says, a sensible difference between hope with a capital H and hope with a small h, just as there is a sensible difference between the logos and words. We must not let Foucault get away with confusing them with each other, nor with letting us forget that history does not get made without work, intention, resistance, effort, or conflict, and that none of these things is silently absorbable into micro-networks of power. Said couldn't see the benefit of theorizing about power and oppression without imagining a humane future society or without some intention of alleviating human suffering, pain, or betrayed hope. In Sydney IDs this evening, we celebrate Edward Said's life and legacy and his hopeful vision of committed intellectual humanism with Dr. Sarah Roy, who is in Australia to deliver the 2008 University of Adelaide's Edward Said Memorial Lecture. Dr. Roy is a senior research scholar at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard University. Since 1985, she has worked in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank on the economic, social, and political development of the Palestinian people and the U.S. foreign aid to the region. <clears throat> 
a distinguished political economist. She has written extensively on the Palestinian economy over the last three decades, including the Gaza Strip survey published in 1986, the Gaza Strip, the political economy of de-development in 1995 and 2001, between extremism and civism, political Islam in Palestine to appear late this year. Her works have established her as the leading authority in the world on social and economic conditions in Gaza, and as one of the world's foremost experts on the de-development of Gaza's economy and its society. This notion, or her notion of development, is a brilliant one, Edward Said says. The special thing about Sarah Roy's writing, he continues, is its combination of very high quality research in this, no one matches her, with an equality or an equally high level of personal integrity and commitment. In her latest book, Failing Peace, Gaza and the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, which she will be signing this evening after the lecture, published in 2007 in memory of Edward Said, Sarah Roy acknowledges her intellectual debt to Said and other great humanists. Writing on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict hasn't been any easy or an easy duty for Sarah Roy. She tells us that those who disagree with her analysis and findings have accused her of being unobjective and unbalanced, that is, pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli, a polemicist for the Palestinian side, even a self-hating Jew. Can intellectuals ever truly be non-political? And should they be? Sarah Roy asks. As a committed scholar, believing in Edward Said's notion of a humanism as a form of disclosure, not of secrecy or religious illumination, Sarah Roy tells us, my commitment is to accuracy, to representing the facts to the best of my ability, not neutrality or objectivity. Neither is possible in any event. Neutrality is often a mask for siding with the status quo, and objectivity, pure objectivity, does not exist, and claiming it is dishonest. One final point about her choices. Sarah Roy reveals that in her intellectual representation, she also seeks to represent something to herself, too. Another link and reference to Edward Said. Who I am and what I represent and the basis of my work are deeply tied to my Holocaust background, she says. The concerns that propel me are rooted in the belief that there is an essential humanity in all people. The themes of my life have always centered on the loss of a humanity and its reclamation and on its amazing resilience even in the face of unimaginable cruelty. Dr. Roy believes that it is only with a shared understanding of suffering and loss that we can humanize the enemies, allowing us to find and then embrace what joining and not what separates us. Humanizing the other, who is often perceived as the enemy, she writes, is a critical task of the humanist scholar. But in order to do so, one must hold to a universal and single standard of basic human justice and of seeking knowledge, despite ethnic or nationalist affiliation. There can be no other way, she says. And I would add that otherwise there could be no real hope this was indeed Edward Said's quest as a humanist intellectual. And this kind of humanism is at the basis of his optimism, especially his firm belief in the intellectuals as sources for hope. Dear friends, with much hope in a humanist and a humane future society in the Middle East, I invite you 
to share with me the ideas of another humanist intellectual, Dr. Sarah Roy. Thank you, Dr. Hajar, for uh, that exquisite introduction. I'm very grateful. It's been <clears throat> delightful being here in Australia, and it was a great honor for me to deliver the Edward Said Memorial Lecture. Edward and I were uh, friends for many years, and he was a great inspiration to me uh, in all my work, even before I knew him. And uh, um, it's been an honor and a privilege to uh, represent him, so to speak, in Australia at the various venues that uh, I've uh, spoken in. Today, I want to discuss with you what I see as critical paradigm shifts in the way that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is conceptualized in the way it is understood and in the way that it is addressed. I see these paradigm shifts as being very dangerous for long-term stability and resolution in the area and uh, would like to spend this time with you in discussing them. Before I begin, or as part of my uh, introduction, I'd like to recount a story, which hopefully will set the framework for the um, rest of the discussion. In one of many reports and accounts of economic life in the Gaza Strip that I've recently read, I was struck by a description of an old man standing on the beach in Gaza, throwing his oranges into the sea. The description leapt out at me because it was this very same scene I myself witnessed over 23 years ago during my very first visit to the territory. It was the summer of 1985, and I was taken on a tour of Gaza by a friend of mine named Alia. As we drove along Gaza's coastal road, I saw an elderly Palestinian man standing at the shoreline with some boxes of oranges next to him. I was puzzled by this and asked Alia to stop the car. One by one, the elderly Palestinian took an orange and threw it into the water. His was not an action of playfulness, but of pain and regret. His movements were slow and labored, as if the weight of each orange was more than he could bear. I asked my friend why he was doing this, and she explained that he was prevented from exporting his oranges to Israel, and rather than watch them rot in his oranges, the old man chose to cast them into the sea. I've never forgotten this scene and the enormous impact it had on me. Over two decades later, after peace conferences, peace agreements, economic protocols, roadmaps, and disengagements, Palestinians are still casting their oranges into the sea. In the last eight years, the transformations in land, labor, economy, and demography in Israel and the occupied territories have been stunning. Palestinians have suffered losses not seen since the beginning of Israeli occupation in 1967 and arguably since the losses of 1948. The current context has many dimensions, but is defined primarily by Israel's continued occupation of Palestinian lands, perhaps most vividly expressed in the continued and widespread expansion of Israeli settlements, the construction of the separation barrier, and the severing of the West Bank from the Gaza Strip. The current context is also defined by rapid socioeconomic decline as Palestinians face the deterioration of their economy, a humanitarian crisis characterized by levels of unemployment and impoverishment unparalleled during Israel's 41-year occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, and the destruction of ordinary life. The dramatic weakening of the Palestinian economy since the start of the second uprising has been accelerated by the international aid embargo imposed on Palestinians after the election and installation of the Hamas-led government over two years ago and intensified after Hamas's takeover of the Gaza Strip in June of uh, 2007. <clears throat> 
However, one need only look at the Palestinian economy, especially Gaza's, on the eve of the uprising, to realize that the devastation is not recent. By the time the Second Intifada broke out in 2000, Israel's closure policy had been enforced for seven years, leading to, by then, unprecedented levels of unemployment and poverty, which would soon, however, be surpassed. Indeed, the present state of Palestinian life, be it economic, social, or political, derives fundamentally from dynamics institutionalized during and by the Oslo peace process. The Oslo process did not aim to dismantle the structure of Israeli occupation, but to maintain and strengthen it, albeit in a different form. The years since the Oslo Agreement saw a marked economic deterioration and an accelerated de-development process that was worsened by the effects of closure, the defining economic feature of the Oslo and post-Oslo periods. This is why, according to the United Nations, the Palestinian economy experienced a 36% decline in national income during the Oslo period. Among closure's damaging results were the physical and demographic separation and isolation of the West Bank in Gaza, the weakening of economic relations between the Palestinian and Israeli economies, which resulted in rising unemployment and poverty and dramatic income losses for Palestinians, and reduced access to markets for both labor and goods. Yet closure proved so destructive only because the then 26-year process of integrating the Palestinian economy into Israel's had made the local economy deeply dependent and weak. As a result, when the border was closed, first in 1991 and later more permanently in 1993, self-sustainment was no longer possible. The means simply weren't there. Palestine had long before been robbed of its developmental potential. Decades of expropriation, integration, and deinstitutionalization had ensured that no viable economic and hence political structure could emerge. These critical features of occupation and those introduced by and during the Oslo process have, of course, been deepened and aggravated by the conditions of the last eight years and the intensification of the conflict. This has included a strengthened Israeli domination of Palestinian resources and deepened and acute economic dependence, the building of the separation barrier in the West Bank, depriving the territory of between 10 to 15 percent of its agricultural land, the further expropriation, cantonization, and isolation of Palestinian lands in the West Bank, continued Israeli settlement expansion, limited access to the Jordan Valley, by non-resident Palestinians, the deepened separation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the isolation of the Gaza Strip following Israel's disengagement in 2005, and other restrictions on Palestinian economy and society resulting from the international boycott. Furthermore, the last eight years have introduced new features with damaging effects on Palestinian society and economy and I'm just going to focus on four. The first is the use of aid as a punitive weapon, not only by Israel, but by the international donor community, including its use of aid to impose a clear political agenda. The international boycott has had a devastating impact on Palestinians. Never before have economic issues been so central to the political conflict in 41 years of occupation. Number two, Israel's decision to sever its economy from that of Palestine's, cutting off economic and commercial ties after four decades of integration and forced dependence. The loss of jobs inside Israel has been particularly devastating for the Palestinian economy, especially Gaza's, with very limited labor fl flows from the West Bank and virtually none from the Gaza Strip. Indeed, by 2007, 30% of the income earned in Israel between 1972 and 2006 was being brought into the Palestinian economy as donor assistance. Third, the precipitous decline of the private sector, the driver of economic growth, especially in Gaza. In Gaza today, one is witnessing the collapse of the private sector due to Israeli closure and blockade, preventing the import of raw materials and the export of finished products. 
This collapse represents the change in Gaza's already fragile economy from one driven in large part by private sector productivity to one dependent on public sector salaries and humanitarian assistance. Prior to Hamas's June 2007 takeover of the Strip, 54% of Gaza's employment was generated by the private sector. Gaza's manufacturers imported 95% of their inputs and exported their finished products primarily to Israel, with some to the West Bank. In June of 2005, there were 3,900 factories employing 35,000 people. By September of 2008, a little over three years later, the number of operating factories had declined to 23. 16 engage in food processing, six produce wheat flour, and only one manufactures clothing. Approximately 100,000 people, virtually the entire private sector, lost their jobs. And fourth, Israel is no longer interested in controlling and dominating the Palestinian economy and shaping it to its own interests, as it did most notably during the first two decades of occupation. Rather, Israel is now seeking to preclude the emergence of a state and a viable economic base upon which to build it by imposing increasingly damaging measures that have reduced Palestinians to a humanitarian problem to which the international community is expected to respond. This is an issue I will describe in greater detail in a few minutes. Today, at least 38% of the West Bank is inaccessible to Palestinians. And depending upon which source you choose to consult, this figure has gone as high as 59%. The intensification and institutionalization of the conditions I've just described have led to some critical paradigmatic shifts in the way the conflict is understood and addressed, to which I now turn. Prior to Oslo, <clears throat> there was a belief among Israelis and within the international community that peace and occupation were incompatible. This has changed. In recent years, more and more Israelis are benefiting from the occupation. Their lives have been facilitated by the vast settlement road network built in the West Bank and by an improved economy resulting from a perceived containment of the conflict and of Palestinians, although this illusion is slowly and tragically being shattered. Settlements are now regarded as natural outgrowth, a needed constituency providing protection and security with important familial links to Israel proper. Thus, the integration of the settlement blocks and their infrastructure into Israel, that is, the argument that the West Bank is part of Israel, is no longer extraordinary or contentious. On the contrary, it is necessary and normal. For many Israelis, and I might add, donors, it is no longer a question of normalizing the occupation, but of removing the term altogether, since it no longer applies, especially in light of a strong and expanding Israeli economy and the virtual cessation of attacks inside Israel. The occupation has been transformed from a political and legal issue with international legitimacy into a simple dispute over borders where the rules of war apply rather than those of occupation. Separating from the Palestinians and doing what is necessary politically, militarily, and economically to ensure and maintain that separation has become similarly routine. Hence, many Israelis and members of the international community no longer feel uncomfortable with the occupation at a time when the occupation has grown more repressive and perverse this, too, may have produced some changes in the lexicon of the conflict that reflect changes in political framing. There is now less talk of territorial contiguity for Palestinians and more of transportational contiguity, a term that first appeared in the Gaza disengagement plan and means that Palestinians would have contact with each other by bridges, tunnels, and for Arab-only roads, a reality that is daily being created in the West Bank. The need to separate from Palestinians and the legitimacy of doing so are now reflected 
in the formalization, institutionalization, and acceptance by Israel, the US, and the international community of Palestinian territorial and demographic fragmentation and cantonization, another key paradigm shift. Such institutionalized fragmentation, which has divided the West Bank into at least 11 cantons and subcantons, is secured by a system of 630 physical impediments blocking Palestinian movement. And they include 93 staff checkpoints and 537 unstaffed obstacles, earth mounds, roadblocks, and other barriers. Furthermore, approximately 65% of the main routes, that is 47 out of 72 routes, leading into the 18 most populated Palestinian localities in the West Bank are either blocked or controlled by military checkpoints. Indeed, the greatest loss confronting Palestinians is a fragmenting social order where cohesion is defined by the boundaries of the enclave and solidarity by the ability to live within it. This divided reality now defines the status quo and clearly precludes territorial contiguity for Palestinians and with it, a viable Palestinian state. Other economic and social implications of fragmentation include isolation from Arab and regional world markets, a reversion to family labor in both business and agriculture and to tr more traditional forms of economic behavior, a pattern of production that is increasingly oriented to local markets and domestic consumption, which is a dynamic that emerged during the Oslo period, and the emergence of economic activities that are a response to and themselves illustrate decline and breakdown, such as the now famous tunnel trade in Gaza, a trade in bullets, a trade in scrap metal picked up by children in garbage piles, and people desperate to work for a few shekels a day. Within such a constrained paradigm, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to introduce structures of change. Another example of fragmentation and the distortion it produces is a description of the West Bank town of Ramallah, a major town in the West Bank, as a thriving economy. While this is not incorrect, it is somewhat of an aberration. While it is true that Ramallah is relatively successful economically, it is also true that it has become conceptually and practically fragmented, detached, and isolated from something larger that is the Palestinian economy. And this larger concept seems now to be disappearing as a conceptual framework and as a legitimate framing of reality. In Gaza, the impact of fragmentation has created far greater distortions. For Gaza, it is not a question of turning inward to the exclusion of a conceptual whole, but of dispensing with the whole entirely. In Gaza, we see a fundamental shift in Israeli policy from one that aims to weaken the economy through punishing closures and other restrictions to a form of blockade that treats the economy as totally irrelevant. This shift is perverse. From engaging with the concept of an economy, whether positively or negatively, to dismissing the concept altogether. This was underlined by the Israeli Supreme Court's decision first approving fuel cuts to Gaza in October of 2007, deemed permissible since these cuts would not harm, quote, the essential humanitarian needs, end quote, of the population, followed in January of 2008 by electricity cuts. The court stated, quote, we do not accept the petitioner's argument that market forces should be allowed to play their role in Gaza with regard to fuel consumption, end quote. It is no longer, and in fact has not been for some time, a question of economic growth or development, of change or reform, of freedom or sovereignty, but of essential humanitarian needs of reducing the needs and rights of 1.4 million people in Gaza to an exercise in counting calories and megawatts, to paraphrase a colleague of mine. As such, Israeli policy allows for and even legitimizes 
the destruction of Gaza's economy, institutions, and infrastructure. Hence, according to the Supreme Court, it is acceptable to harm Palestinians and create a humanitarian crisis for political reasons. Does that therefore mean that once these undefined essential humanitarian needs are met, all other deprivation is possible? How does one and where does one begin to rehabilitate and rebuild an economy and society so devastated? The steady an unrelenting imposition of Israeli imperatives, which include the dismemberment of the West Bank and any possibility of a Palestinian state, gave rise to a shift in the way foreign governments, some aid agencies, and other international organizations frame future is Israeli-Palestinian relations. This shift is away from a notion of two states and those features of state building and political sovereignty associated with the Palestinian state in particular, toward a vision that emphasizes, again, humanitarian over political priorities. Palestinians are reduced to a demographic presence in small and impoverished enclaves to be treated as a humanitarian issue for the international community to look after. Unable to mobilize politically or economically, demoted to statelessness in their own homes. Put differently, despite more than $12 billion in international assistance spent since 1993, the Palestinian economy has been greatly weakened, some have argued destroyed, and public institutions severely fractured. With unemployment levels reaching between 35 and 45 percent in Gaza, and 25 and 26 percent in the West Bank, and poverty levels of 79 percent in Gaza and 46 percent in the West Bank. The transformation of Palestinians as a national group and sovereign people into a humanitarian problem seems to be approaching completion. In 1999, UNRWA, the UN agency responsible for Palestinian refugees, UNRWA was feeding 16,174 families. At present, it feeds 182,400 families, which gives you an idea of the level of poverty. Furthermore, despite high levels of relief aid, Palestinians are more food insecure. 56% of Gazan households are food insecure and 66% of earned income is spent on food, and the figures for the West Bank are similar. According to the World Food Program, 75% of Palestinians have reduced the amount of food purchased, and 89% have reduced the quality of food they buy. The resulting lack of nutrition has raised anemia levels among children with likely long-term health consequences. As one Palestinian economist poignantly stated to me, she said, quote, we started with food aid and we have returned to food aid. We have come full circle, end quote. The violence that has erupted and will continue to erupt, which reduces Palestinians to mere perpetrators, is a price the Israeli government appears willing to pay for the territorial gains it guarantees. Diminishing the Palestinians as a national group and sovereign people into a humanitarian problem is now amplified by the growing de-urbanization of the West Bank through the loss of metropolitan urban areas and the de-Arabization of Jerusalem. According to Professor Sari Maktisi, quote, 90% of the Palestinian territory Israel claimed to have annexed to Jerusalem after 1967 is today off limits to Palestinian development because the land is either already built on by exclusively Jewish settlements or being reserved for their future expansion, end quote. Palestinian urban areas generate 90% of national GDP, with Jerusalem contributing 40% alone. The loss of Jerusalem, therefore, will have a damaging economic impact 
that will be and is exacerbated by the isolating effect of the separation barrier. Hence, the separation and isolation of Palestinians from and within Jerusalem, from Israel and via Israel the world, and from each other, their cities and their lands, weakens the possibility of urban development for reasons that are really quite simple. People, goods, and resources cannot access urban areas or can only access them intermittently, separated as they are by Israeli-controlled territory. Planning is impossible, as is expansion, and the delivery of services is obstructed. In May of 2006, a New York Times editorial surprisingly captured the problem and put it this way, quote, imagine a map of Manhattan. The West Bank would be very roughly East Harlem and the Upper East Side. Gaza would be Battery Park City far to the Southwest. Now imagine trying to create a fully functioning city with its own economy out of these pieces while an entirely independent antagonistic city remained in between." End quote. Transforming Palestinians into perpetrators has assumed different dimensions since Hamas's electoral victory, particularly with regard to the changing nature of physical destruction in the West Bank. The Israeli journalist, Amira Haas, has described to me a steady process of destroying many vestiges of Palestinian life in the West Bank as they have historically existed. Old roads long used by Palestinians traveling between major towns and surrounding villages are being eliminated as are traditional intersections, buildings, and certain commercial areas. What is happening, according to Amira, is no less than the erasure of a Palestinian presence in the West Bank treating Palestinians as intruders without claim. Another new and related feature is the increasing bureaucratization of Israel's system of control. In addition to the political imperatives underlying checkpoints, terminals, and other physical barriers, there is now a growing bureaucratic imperative that has its own interests, needs, and priorities. Bureaucratizing this structure helps to depoliticize and normalize it, normalize it making, by making it a necessary and permanent part of everyday life. In fact, some terminals in the West Bank, I am told, are no longer manned by soldiers but are fully automated, while a growing number of others are operated by private Israeli security firms. Furthermore, one must add to this Israel's intense, almost complete bureaucratic control of everyday life in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, including permits to build one's home, access to one's land, uh, permits for visiting Jerusalem, driving a car, and going to hospital. As Makdisi argues, quote, on its own, no ceasefire will relieve the beleaguered Palestinians, end quote. Treating Palestinians as intruders and transforming them into a humanitarian issue illustrates the critical shift in Israel's intentions towards the Palestinians and their territories from one of ongoing occupation to one of annexation and imposed sovereignty. That is, again, turning the West Bank or parts of the West Bank into an extension of Israel. This is a critical paradigmatic shift that is now accepted by the international community following Hamas's electoral victory and takeover of Gaza and Hamas's unwillingness to formally renounce terror and recognize Israel. The days have passed when Israel feared international criticism for its actions in the occupied territories. The red lines, which were once there, have disappeared. Indeed, according to some Israeli officials, not only will foreigners soon require a visa to enter the West Bank as they now do for Gaza, soon Palestinians themselves will need a visa to move between the West Bank's major towns. Not only have key members of the donor community participated in the US-led boycott of the Hamas government in Gaza, some are now embarking on policies effectively designed to keep Palestinians locked in their enclaves. 
For example, the thrust of some donor programs is now focused on microfinance, of helping people feed themselves in their enclaves rather than dealing with the structural distortions that is the occupation that have produced those enclaves to which people are confined. Similarly, some donors are actively supporting the creation of industrial estates, the majority to be located on the unilaterally defined border between Israel and the West Bank. These zones are meant to provide employment for over 100,000 Palestinian laborers now prohibited from entering Israel. And by creating linkages with the local economy, these zones will generate additional jobs domestically. Although these zones, which I might add is an old and failed strategy, now resurrected, although these zones will provide desperately needed employment, they will do so by creating an artificial economy built around Palestinian and foreign-owned economic enclaves totally controlled by Israel, which will reinforce rather than resolve the fragmentation and dependency of the Palestinian economy. Furthermore, donor strategies that by design or effect support and strengthen the fragmentation and isolation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip that divide Palestinians into two distinct entities, offering exclusivity to one side, economically, politically, and diplomatically, one good in the West Bank and the other evil in Gaza, one deserving of sustenance and largesse and the other not, will have dire consequences, not only for Palestinians, but for all of us. As Karen Abu Zaid, the Commissioner General of UNRWA, recently warned, she said, quote, Gaza is on the threshold of becoming the first territory to be intentionally reduced to a state of abject destitution with the knowledge, acquiescence, and some would say encouragement of the international community, end quote. Furthermore, Palestinian society is now largely dependent for its survival on external aid and not on its own productive resources and energies. According to the analyst Khalil Nahle, quote, nearly one million live on their PA monthly salaries, which are dependent on receiving donations from the outside on time. No less than 40 to 50,000 live directly on their salaries from externally funded NGOs. And some many more thousands live on NGO projects, etc. Thus, the livelihood of most Palestinians who have steady, quote unquote, income is mortgaged by political decisions external to them and beyond their control, end quote. No longer is there serious talk of development or change, of capacity building or institutional or infrastructural change. Instead, there is talk of survival and containment. Increasingly, economic activities are evolving as a response to and themselves illustrate decline and breakdown and the unwillingness of the donor governments to meaningfully, and by that I mean politically, challenge the status quo. This unwillingness represents nothing less than collusion with maintaining Israel's occupation. This is compellingly argued in a recent report authored by 21 aid agencies working on the ground in Palestine, condemning the failure of the quartet composed of the United States, Russia, the EU, and UN, not only to advance the peace process, but their active role in undermining it. Hence, any resistance on the part of Palestinians to Israel's repressive occupation, including attempts at economic empowerment and social rehabilitation are now considered illegitimate and unlawful. Arguably, this was the case after 9-11, when Ariel Sharon successfully argued that Israel's fight against the Palestinians was part of America's global war against terrorism, and any resistance to Israel was therefore illicit. The belief that occupation is reversible, that it will one day end, and that it should one day end has also changed. And this too represents another key paradigmatic shift 
Israeli expansion is not only treated as accepted and defining of the Palestinian status quo, it is unstoppable, as seen most dramatically in the continued expansion of Israeli settlements and their infrastructure in the West Bank and in the West Bank Wall. If the occupation has changed over time, it is in the sheer nature of its expansion and force, not in its contraction and reversibility. The imperative of expansion remains unchallenged, and the longer it remains so, the more difficult it will be to reverse. By May of 2007, for example, there were 149 settlements in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, housing close to 422,000 settlers, which represents a doubling of the settler population since 1993, the beginning of the Oslo process. During the first half of this year, construction in settlements nearly doubled from the same period in 2007, increasing by a factor of 1.8. And there are many more statistics illustrating the absolute ferocity of settlement expansion. The result is a surrounded and militarily controlled Palestinian entity consisting of, one, the Gaza Strip, the most violent, since it resists Israeli policy in a way the West Bank political elite does not, and the most abnormal. And two, it consists of an internally fractured and dismembered West Bank consisting of non-contiguous enclaves where some semblance of normalcy is allowed and encouraged because it is these enclaves that Israel would eventually like to call the Palestinian state. It seems ironic that now the formation of Palestine is coupled, in fact predicated, on the nullification of Palestinians. It is critical to understand that previous agreements with Israel have limited and even restricted the options for peace and development and have not expanded them. They have also led to dramatic economic, political, and social declines for Palestinians. Israel's occupation of Palestine and Palestinian dependence on Israel and external donors did not mitigate or end with the Oslo Accords. They were intensified by those accords. Any challenge to the system imposed, that is, any attempt to challenge previous agreements and what they have wrought, will be, will be considered a threat, no matter how many compromises Palestinians make. Thus, even if they formed a government acceptable to Israel and the West, as they did last year, a government in the West Bank that, I might add, derives its legitimacy from Western support and not from its own people, and the conditions of life improved as they have for a minority, Palestinians would still find themselves, as they do, under an oppressive occupation, confined to a set of agreements that by design undermine their freedom, sovereignty, and development as far away from statehood as they have ever been. Within this paradigm, Palestinians have been severely punished for trying to defend themselves against policies that oppress them. Rather, Palestinians and the governments elected to represent them are expected, indeed required, by Israel, the United States, the European Union, and certain Arab states to submit to Israeli actions in effect to collaborate with Israeli policy and oppose any form of popular resistance to those policies. Palestinians become aliens in their own land, living in submission and dependence, and Gaza, of course, is the starkest illustration of this. These conditions led to the terrible factional violence that has long marred the Gaza Strip and West Bank and resulted in Hamas's military seizure of the Gaza Strip in June of last year. Hamas and Fatah are now stated enemies, each seeking to eliminate the other, a reality that is also new and indeed the greatest internal challenge facing Palestinians today. Perhaps the most telling illustration of Palestinian political decline is the creation of two authorities, in effect two states for one people, reinforcing if not legitimizing Palestine's dissection, its fragmentation and disablement, and the erosion of the Palestinian national movement. Neither of these two authorities is constitutionally legal. The one in Gaza, 
Hamas, was dissolved but continues to govern, while the one in Ramallah, Fatah, is provisional and should have, ha should have held elections long ago. The system of dual authority and political division that has emerged is absurd and dysfunctional, forcing people to think in terms of their own individual survival rather than in terms that are collective and national. With this distorted paradigm, it, within this distorted paradigm, it is consumption rather than production that is the marker of success. As Amira Haas describes, quote, public sector employees in Gaza who obey orders from Ramallah not to go to work, receive salaries, and accrue long service pay. Then they go mad at home with nothing to do. Those who do go to work have their official salary suspended, but receive a salary from the Hamas government instead, end quote. Because of this absurd and deformed reality, the political imperatives now confronting Palestinians, itself entirely new, is no longer a choice between Israeli occupation and a Palestinian state, but between partition and deepening internal and external violence. Yet this choice has another potentially different one embedded within it, a changing discourse around territory and people. And if there is any hope in this very grim picture I am describing, perhaps it is here. Throughout the last 40 years of Palestinian politics, Palestinians have focused on territory over people. With a failed peace process, a house divided on itself, and the loss and fragmentation of their lands and the very real impossibility of creating a state on the West Bank in Gaza with East Jerusalem as its capital, the political focus is increasingly taking shape around human, civil, economic, social, and national rights, around individual and social well-being and equity, and around civil movements. The demands will not change, but the discourse will be different with different stages and agents. The stage will not be confined to Israel and Palestine, but will increasingly shift towards an international arena. And many believe that the agents of this change will be an alliance between Palestinian and international civil society and grassroots movements. Whether we agree with it or not, the campaign by Palestinian academics and intellectuals to organize an international academic boycott of Israeli universities can be understood in this light, as can other programmatic initiatives by Palestinian groups aiming to rethink strategically the status of Jerusalem's Arab residents and of the Arab citizens of Israel. This emerging strategic shift has at its core, demands for equality, parity, and mutuality. Its final political expression, however, remains to be seen. And this points to another critical paradigm shift that I see among Palestinians, which I would describe as a new fearlessness and demand for equality. Human beings who are deprived of their rights and humanity who have long experienced what Martin Luther King referred to as the numbing reality of nothingness, will tolerate it for some time, and then they will not. I feel Palestinians have now reached this point. People are no longer afraid of Israel's military strength and will not be silenced by it, a defiance that can be seen in other parts of the Arab world as well. People are prepared to die, as they've told me, as a price of their liberation and rehumanization. Paraphrasing a Palestinian friend of mine, he said, quote, our rights are not to be given sequentially, but simultaneously with Israel. They are no longer conditional. There must be a single standard of morality, and it must be applied consistently and universally. The days of interim arrangements, confidence building measures, and preconditions are over. We are fully prepared to live in peace with Israel, but according to a new set of rules that are based on the universality of the rule of law." End quote. 
Yet the situation remains extremely volatile and dangerous. Perhaps the greatest mistake being made by the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank and the international community is their continued embrace of a policy that seeks to demonize and isolate the Islamists who have made it clear that they are willing to talk and that their highest priority is intra-Palestinian reconciliation. Put simply, there can be no credible political or economic process with a Palestinian government that excludes the party elected by Palestinians to govern them, or that excludes, in effect, Gaza. Writing in January of this year, Professor Dror Zaevi of Ben Gurion University said, quote, several months ago, I participated in a series of meetings in Europe that involved a small group of Israeli and Palestinian public figures and academics, including senior Hamas supporters. Hamas's Gaza rulers are indeed different than West Bank rulers and are uninterested in a historical compromise with Israel, but they are interested in shifting the conflict from the battlefield to the diplomatic field and are making logical proposals. We should listen to them." End quote. It is also important to remember that it was Khaled Michal, Hamas's head, and not Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, whose movement brokered an agreement with Israel before the end of the Bush administration. And here I am referring to the bilateral ceasefire between Hamas and Israel that went into effect on June 18, 2008. The ceasefire also calls for a gradual end to the siege imposed on Gaza and renewed negotiations on a prisoner exchange, including the release of the Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit captured in 2006. Resolution lies in four things, and with this I conclude. First, it lies in restoring freedom, not in reducing it. Second, resolution lies in intra-Palestinian reconciliation. This is absolutely essential. Third, resolution lies in reciprocity. If Palestinians are offered something equal in return for what is being demanded of them, such as Israeli compliance with international law, the end of settlement expansion, the dismantling of settlements, and an end to land expropriations, home demolitions, and the policy of targeted assassinations, to name just a few. In short, the end or the beginning of the end of occupation. The process would then become mutual and parallel and have some hope of achieving meaningful results. The goal should not be to honor previous agreements, but to rewrite them through a process of negotiation. Palestinian and Israeli national and economic rights must be addressed equally and simultaneously. Fourth, resolution lies in the willingness of the international community to link economic action to political action and to play an honorable role. Without this linkage, little will change under current conditions. I would like to end this address with a quote from Albert Camus. This is a quote that I've used before, and uh, I find it is uh, particularly appropriate here. He writes, the contention was that we needed justice first and that we would come to freedom later on, as if slaves could ever hope to achieve justice. And forceful intellectuals announced to the worker that bread alone interested him rather than freedom, as if the worker didn't know that his bread depends in part on his freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Roy, for this um, heart-breaking. Mm. It's uh, impressive and still hopeful presentation. So thank you very much. And um, Dr. Roy is uh, happy to take questions <coughs> from you for till 8 o'clock, so that's for 20 minutes. <laughs>
please, if you have any questions, um, we have the microphone here, so um, you can. And after the uh, questions, uh, Dr. Roy will sign her uh, book, Failing Peace. Is it? Yes. Failing Peace in the uh, foyer. You have indeed painted a very grim picture. I was wondering if you could comment at all on the um, emotional and psychological effects that this is having on the Palestinians. You know, the, the time that I spend there with people, one thing that constantly uh, impacts me is that people mourn for the life that they could have had. Uh, people still, after all these years, uh, remain hopeful, or some people, perhaps less so now, I don't know, that some kind of um, change will come that will allow them to live ordinary, boring lives and to have the kind of existence that you and I, and most people, I think, take for granted, or many people take for granted. And there's a, a, a still a sense of hope, but there's also a sense of urgency. And, um, and among some, I think, a real uh, fear and longing and mourning, I think that's the, the right word, a mourning for a, the life that they could have had and still want very much. Uh, you know, in the many, many years that I have been doing this work and many years that I've spent with Palestinians in their homes, in the camps, in villages, towns, wherever, uh, one theme has constantly recurred as a result of the occupation, and that is that people are still very stunned and shocked by the ways in which they are treated by Israeli soldiers, by the dehumanizing, demeaning way. Despite it all, I think that one of the things that, one of the feelings that most offend, horrify, insult, demean people is the very dehumanizing way in which they're treated. Over and over, I would hear and still hear and have long heard people say to me, why do soldiers treat us that way? Don't they realize that we're human beings just like them? Don't they realize that we are mothers and fathers, that we have children like they have children, that we love our children like they love their children? And this is, you know, again, it's, it's hard to convey, but if there is anything that um, has hurt and damaged people at the psychological and emotional level, I think it is that. This is something, as I said, I have heard for so long consistently, for 23 years. Um, beyond that, of course, there are many studies that have now highlighted and discussed in great detail the emotional and psychological trauma suffered by Palestinians. Also. Um, um, by Israelis looking specifically, or more specifically, at Palestinian children and Israeli children. Um, war and violence is a horrible thing, and it takes a toll on both societies, disproportionately on Palestinian, there's no doubt. And you have a society, too, that is extremely young. We ha must remember that Palestinian society is uh, very young. 50% of the population is 14 years of age and younger, and I think 60% is around 19 years of age and younger. So you have children who have grown up knowing nothing but occupation. You have children who have grown up knowing nothing or, or um, largely knowing violence and insecurity. You have children who have grown up without many of the socializing institutions that we all take for granted, an intact family, schools, community organizations, um, at, you know, proper health care, uh, sports, games, I mean, just a normal, ordinary life. And these socializing mechanisms have weakened considerably. And this, coupled with the 
great violence in children's lives, the uh, l loss of economic opportunity, the impoverishment of people, so on and so forth, has had a dramatic emotional and psychological toll. And this has all been documented, and it's in the literature. And one other point I'd like to make um, that I didn't make in my talk, and that is important, in terms of paradigm changes or shifts. And that is, you know, in my many discussions with people in the donor community uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, particularly um, uh, international donors, people who are working on the ground with Palestinians daily, they have expressed to me in the last year or so a sense of urgency that I have not heard in all my years of living and working in this territory. And that urgency comes from the very real damage being done not only to the economy, but to the society. The damage incurred by people as a result of this terrible abuse that is now um, being imposed on them. And what what the members of the donor community are afraid of is that we are reaching a point where the damage is so acute on all levels that it will take decades, not years, but decades to reverse it. And how, in light of the current situation, is that possible? Thank you for your talk. Um, I have first an anecdote and then a question. Um, recently, last year in Australia, we had an intervention in Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory, a part of which was the revocation of native title on Crown land that had previously been granted native title on, and some of that land the Indigenous communities had built buildings on. So when native title was revoked on the land, they lost control of these buildings, and they have, to an extent, sought compensation unsuccessfully for the buildings that they lost control over. I've discussed this with many of my peers and have received various responses, but the most interesting response was from Israeli debaters in chips um, <laughs> earlier this year, mm -hmm. whose response was, if the communities did not receive planning permission to build the buildings, they could not possibly, categorically, have any claim to compensation over those buildings. Mm. So I'd thought of that when, I, when you talked about the changing attitudes in Israel, because that is an idea that would not have crossed the minds of any <laughs> Australians that I know. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about some of the language that's used in this area, and in particular, the terms anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, and pro-Israel. Mm -hmm. And if you can perhaps give me a sense of what those words mean to you and how they weigh into this debate? Mm -hmm. Well, I actually, that's a very good question. I um, deal with those issues in the, um, in the preface to the book, Failing Peace. Um, throughout my work, uh, uh, as Dr. Hajar so, so clearly stated in her beautiful introduction, um, I've often been accused of being pro-Palestinian, anti-Israeli, a self-hating Jew, a self-abnegating Jew, whatever that means, um, uh, all sorts of names and, and titles, and, and even an anti-Semitic Jew um, by various groups. And you know, these are labels that are assigned to try to delegitimize the person. If you can't delegitimize the message, or if you can't challenge the message, you challenge the. Me you try to delegitimize the messenger. Uh, when I conf am confronted by this, I maintain, always have maintained, that I do not represent Palestinians. If you want a Palestinian perspective, you have to speak to a Palestinian. What I represent is my perspective, my position based on you know, nearly a generation worth of work and experience in this area. And we all have positions on this issue. Everybody who comes to this conflict has a position. The question is, what is that position based on? 
and from what does it emerge and, and from what does it evolve. And so my, my perspective, which is mine and mine alone, is not pro-Palestinian, it is not anti-Israeli. It is a perspective informed by you know, 23 years of work and research and study and examination and by a commitment, a profound commitment, to try to end what is a profoundly unjust situation so that both communities can find a way to live peacefully and peaceably together. As a friend of mine long ago said, to find a mutually unacceptable arrangement. Yes. Thank you. Uh, in your talk, you uh in your talk, you spoke about the uh, strikes and stoppages by. Uh, I'm sorry. In your talk, yes. you spoke about the strikes and the stoppages by doctors and teachers in the Gaza Strip, which allegedly have been organised by uh, pro Fatah or Fatah aligned trade unions. And similarly, to a much smaller extent, there have been stoppages in the West Bank, which allegedly are uh, done by uh, Hamas-influenced uh, work groups. Later on in your talk, you spoke about the growth of new independent civil society groups. Is there any sign of these trade unions? Uh, there are independent civil society trade unions which are not controlled by either the Fatah elite or a Hamas elite representing these workers? You know, I honestly can't answer that with any um, authority because I just don't know. But uh, what I can say to you, uh, or what I'd like to reemphasize, is that um, more and more organizations are breaking away from the existing political structure. And this probably involves trade unions as well. I wouldn't be surprised if it, it did. Um, there is in, in Palestine now um, a new phenomenon, and that is, for want of a better term, the emergence of uh, the, a Pal the Palestinian independence. Um, and by that I mean people who are uh, completely alienated and disaffected from political life as it had existed, who are turned off by factional politics, who want no part of Fatah, want no part of Hamas. Um, and who uh, are seeking some kind of um, way to be mobilized and um, uh, seeking some, some way to uh, uh, express themselves politically um, in a manner that doesn't involve uh, loyalty or membership or commitment to one political faction or another. And I think that, and these people come from all walks of life. They come from the rich and the poor. They come from the working class, from the professional class. They come from villages and towns. It's a very broad spectrum, and it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon within Palestinian society because this hasn't existed before. And um, they come from different or kinds of organizations, I'm told, and I suspect trade unions as well, but I can't address that specifically. And it's these individuals um, that are beginning, I think, to mobilize around within this sort of civil society uh, construct because people feel that this is an area in which they can empower themselves, particularly by creating alliances with other groups um, internationally. And I can tell you that uh, they've been very successful both in Great Britain and um, in the United States, not wanting to overemphasize or overstate, I should say, not overemphasize, but overstate uh, the magnitude of the enterprise. But it's definitely um, a dynamic that is there and is growing. Um, and I think represents some hope for this society. Um, the separation you were speaking of, particularly between where Israel used to be attempting to dominate the Palestinian economy to they've now separated themselves from it, and also with the construction of physical barriers between Israelis and Palestinians. Given that the rhetoric in Israeli politics and in Palestinian politics recently has pretty much been towards a two-state solution, could these not be seen as a move towards a, create, a creation of two distinct states? Many people feel that, um, and I 
I agree with them that given the current you know matrix of control to you use Jeff Halper's term this the, the the structure of control in the West Bank and Gaza the settlement expansion many of the things that I've described that the two state solution is over it's been superseded by facts on the ground and by the reality um, if the concept of two states exists in any shape or form there now. Um, it would be in the, uh, and I use states, you know, in inverted commas, it would be in this very terrible and I think dangerous separation of Gaza and the West Bank and in nothing else. If you're referring to two states, and you know, state of Israel and a Palestinian state, um, that is for all intents and purposes impossible under current you know, constraints and conditions. Could it happen under the right conditions? Could it be um, created? Should, uh, should uh, the political will exist to create it? Sure, of course it could. But when you have a situation, as I've described, where nearly 40% using a conservative estimate, 38%, is the conservative estimate, where 38% of the West Bank is no longer accessible to Palestinians, where you have you know, um, massive settlement expansion, over 400,000 settlers, and where you have a, a road system connecting not only Israeli settlements to each other, but to connecting the settlements to um, Israel proper. And, and these roads run, again, I apologize for not having brought maps because maps illustrate this very powerfully. Um, you have a, a road system, a grid, running in the West Bank from north to south and east to west. And uh, during the Oslo period, 250 miles of settlement roads were laid down, some of them on confiscated Arab land, and I might add, with the, um, with the permission of uh, Yasser Arafat uh, to take this land for building of these roads. Um, and today the road network has expanded, and again, depending upon which source you consult, the range it lies between 435 miles of settlement roads to the largest figure I've seen is 1,029 miles. But even if it's you know 250, it, it is quite dramatic. It further fragments and truncates Palestinian land and takes away um, um, their ability to move normally within their, own, uh, within their own territory because Palestinians do not have access to these roads. And I've been on them. I've been on some of these settlement roads. And when you're on them, you would never know you're in an Arab locality. And you would not know that at all. So, you know, two states to me is... Um, um, it's, it's increasingly abstract, given the reality there. And, and this reality, again, I want to emphasize, this reality, the dynamics underlying the emergence of all this, uh, were, were introduced and deepened uh, during the Oslo period. You know, the settlement expansion, the fragmentation of Palestinian lands was a direct feature of the second Oslo agreement. This did not happen by accident. And so what we see today, in my view at least, is the logical outcome, the logical extension of intentions that informed the Oslo agreements 15 years ago. Thank you actually for uh, our audience for the short questions. So let's keep them, <laughs> keep them still short so we finish on time. Yes, okay. please. Hopefully. <laughs> I'm not there. <laughs> Thank you. So I also come from Belize, but I come from an Islamic country. Uh, uh, I strongly support the Palestinian uh, right, Palestinian people, uh, and strongly against Israeli government that they are destroying the life of Palestinian and the country of the Palestinian. But at the same time, I am also strongly against political Islam and Islamic fundamentalism. The history has shown that the political Islam and Islamic fundamentalism, they are so good, so brave, before they come to the power, like the brutal Khomeini. Uh, he, was, he was saying so many beautiful things about, about, the, about what, he, what he will do for Iranian people. And uh, 
uh, but we are facing 30 years of the brutality of the political Islam in Iran and in Afghanistan by Taliban. Do you think, is that not necessary that we should, I know that the Palestinian case is different. They, as a last resort, they have to follow whoever is defending them. But do you think, is that not necessary that we always should tell them also that whoever as a political Islam come to the power can be the same brutal like Islamic government in Iran? Thank you very much. Palestinians have always been a profoundly secular people. Um, and the election of, of Hamas uh, in 2006 hasn't changed that. In fact, Hamas's ideological following among Palestinians has never been great. I mean, it exists, and by that I mean there are people who support Hamas on the basis of its ideology. Um, but they've been, um, they've been in a minority. And Hamas itself uh, is a far more pragmatic movement uh, than is typically re than its typical representation in the West. And Hamas's election was was not based on a, a belief or a desire on the part of Palestinians to see an Islamic government in Palestine, absolutely not. Hamas's election was, one, a vote against the corruption and uh, betrayal, as Palestinians saw it, of the uh, Fatah government during the Oslo period, and was also um, a result of a party platform, a political platform, that promised change and reform, that promised some very real and pragmatic um, changes in the lives of Palestinians. So it wasn't, it was two, twofold. And Hamas, and I'm, pe several people have written about Hamas, and I, I myself am uh, completing a book now. Um, if you look at the history of this organization uh, since its inception uh, 20 years ago, um, you see that this is um, not a group that is the same by any stretch of the imagination as the Taliban or uh, the, um, uh, the kinds of uh, government you would see in, in Iran. To the contrary, in fact, my many interviews with Hamas officials over the years um, have shown, and they themselves have made a point of emphasizing to me that they are not like the Taliban and like these groups. And if you look at their political platform and you look at what they've been saying for the last 20 years, and they have, of course, matured. They have grown and they have become a far more sophisticated, far more complicated um, organization than they were when, when they began. Um, in the final analysis, whether we like it or not, and it's clearly not up to us to like it or dislike it, but Hamas is, is a part of this landscape. It's a part of the society. And through its um, social service work in Gaza and the West Bank, but, but uh, especially in Gaza, they have played an increasingly important role in this society. And um, unlike many of the secular political movements, the secular nationalist movements during the Oslo period, they maintain their ties to the grassroots. A lot of these groups cut them for various reasons. Uh, Hamas remained very consistent and very deeply connected to the community and to society. And you know, of course, people say this is a way they buy political support and um, they promote their ideological vision and so on and so forth, but Palestinians aren't that stupid. Um, people are not going to support an Islamic state because they receive uh, relief assistance from an Islamic organization. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And, the, and in the final analysis, I just want to say, they are elected, they have been elected by the Palestinians. They are part of the political and social landscape. And if we want to uh, see a resolution, they have to be incorporated into any kind of political process. They are part of that society, and it's certainly not up to the American government or the Israeli government to decide 
who is acceptable on the Palestinian side to talk to. You talk to, you talk to the representatives of, uh, of that group. It's like, it's like Palestinians coming and saying, well, we don't like George Bush. We're offended by him, so we're not going to negotiate with the Americans. It's the same sort of thing. These people have been elected. They have made it clear that they are willing to talk, which is precisely the reason, I believe, that they are being continually demonized. It's not because uh, the Israel and the West believe that they cannot talk to Hamas. It's because they know they can. So, yes. Do we still uh, can fit one short question? Okay, maybe one, one more. Short, one short answer. All right. Um, Thank you. The final, the final question. Okay. Uh, I was reading Imperialism and Resistance by Chan Rees, and uh, it's a very short passage. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz described the situation perfectly in 1951. Israel. Sorry. No, the, the Israel is to become the watchdog. There is no fear that Israel will undertake any aggressive policy towards the. And this would contradict the wishes of the U.S. and Britain. But if for any reason the Western powers should sometimes prefer to close their eyes, Israel could be relied upon to punish one or several neighboring states whose disgust went beyond of the permissible. Uh, your what? Well, I'm not sure I heard the last part of that quote because the microphone went dead. But let me end with this, and this will be a response to you, I hope, as well. In 1947, the first president of Israel, Chaim Weissman, said that the Jewish state will be judged, ultimately, by how it treats the Arabs in its midst. Thank you. Not only I would like actually you to join me in thanking um, Dr. Sarah Roy for her illuminating and inspiring analysis, but also would like to thank Sydney Ideas for hosting this yes, um, lecture. So thank, thank you. you very much. This is ABC Fora.